Hello, everyone. Welcome to Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I'm really delighted by this episode that you're about to see with Professor Johanna Pink of the University of Freiburg in uh, Germany. She is probably the world's leading scholar on uh, Quranic um, interpretation, the genre known as tafsir, but also is leading a remarkable project on uh, Quran translations. We'll be speaking about what does that mean? What are the boundaries between um, tafsir or interpretation and translation? The theological questions that arise both with tafsir and with translation, and some of the social and political dimensions of the whole question of interpreting the Quran. Um, we also have some conversation about why fantasy books are great. Um, and we'll, we'll get to know um, uh, her work with the Global Quran Project. So I really encourage you to watch through the whole thing. Global Quran Project stuff comes up towards the end. So watch the whole thing. Um, also like the video. And while you're here, um, be sure that you're subscribed to Exploring the Quran and the Bible. And I'll be really grateful if you um, spread the news to all of your friends and everyone else um, about this channel. Well, hello, Professor Pink. Thanks for being here. Hi, thanks for inviting me. It's really um, great to have a friend and colleague, um, Professor Johanna Pink, on exploring the Quran and the Bible. Um, we'll do a brief uh, introduction um, to her work and uh, her her, um, her research and teaching, and um, then we'll move to a conversation about uh, about tafsir, especially so interpretation of the Quran, but also about um, translations and what are the boundaries between tafsir and translation. So. Um, yeah, Professor Fink and I um, have um, connected in different contexts, including meetings for the International Quranic Studies Association, but she is a, a well-known scholar, um, particularly on interpretation in the, uh, the uh, Indonesian tradition, but also sort of globally Quranic interpretation. So yeah, thanks again for being here. Thanks, Dan. Okay, so here's my formal introduction. Professor Johanna Pink received her MA degree from the University of Bonn in 1998 and her PhD from the same university with a dissertation on new religious communities in Egypt in 2002. She's held positions at the University of Tübingen, the Free University in Berlin between 2002, 2009. Between 2009 and 2011, she acted as a visiting professor at these two universities and was then granted a Heisenberg Fellowship by the German Research Foundation she has been professor of Islamic studies and the history of Islam at the University of Freiburg since 2012. And she's also the head of two really important projects in the fields of Quranic studies. First, she is the general editor of the Encyclopedia of the Quran with Brill, which is the standard reference work in the field. And she is also the principal investigator of the Global Quran Project uh, funded by the European Research Council. And I will get to that. We'll speak a little bit about the activities of that project. Professor Pink's research interests include early modern and modern Quranic exegesis, Quranic translations with a special focus on Indonesia, the status of non-Muslims in Muslim majority societies, religious discourses, and the recent history of Egypt. Her list of publications is very long. So I'll just mention a few, uh, beginning with her dissertation. Um, which uh, in German is Neue Religionsgemeinschaften in Ägypten, Minderheiten in Spangensfeld von Glaubensfreiheit, Öffentlichen Ordnung und Islam. So maybe I can turn to you for an English translation. How would you do that? Um, new religious communities in Egypt, minorities between freedom of belief, public order and Islam. Great, thank you. And then in 2011, she published with Brill, Sunnitische Tafsir in the, it's funny that I'm doing the German with the bad pronunciation. <laughs> Sunnitische uh, Tafsir maybe, in der modernen islamischen Welt. <laughs> great, perfect. And then I'll try the translations. This one I think I can handle. Something like uh, Sunni Tafsir in the modern Islamic world. Yeah. And um, one more German work uh, from 2014 by Beck. Uh, which is Geschichte Ägyptens von der Spätantike bis zur Gegenwart. So the history of Egypt from late antiquity to the present time, something like that. Is that okay? Yeah. And then with Oxford University Press in 2014, there's a collected work which he co-edited with Professor Andreas Goerke, Tafsir and Islamic Intellectual History. She uh, edited a special issue of the Journal of Quranic Studies in 2015 entitled Translations of the Quran in Muslim Majority Context. And then most recently, she has published uh, with Equinox, Muslim Quranic Interpretation Today, Media Genealogies and Interpretive Communities. It's interesting to see the early works in German and the more recent works in English. I think this is a general trend among German speaking academics to publish in English. 
Yeah, yeah, obviously. I mean, the field is so small and we want people to, to read our work and take notice of it. Right. And German is so difficult for non, non-native speakers. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Well, I just thought I'd start with some general um, questions just so we can get to know you a bit better. So maybe we'll start with um, your journey in the field of um, if Islamic studies. How did you enter? Um, how did you get into um, doing, um, doing the things you do in the academic world? Um, okay. I, th- I think I was just very naive. I wanted to do something with foreign languages, preferably non-European languages, because I had done a number of European ones at school and I thought that was boring. So I was very interested in doing Arabic. And I was also interested in religion. I, I had been to a Christian school and um, had actually taken Catholic religion as a major, which is possible in German schools. Um, so yeah, Islamic studies seemed like an interesting choice and um, it was kind of a bumpy ride because learning Arabic was very hard and I had no experience in any Muslim majority country whatsoever. Um, but then after three years, I went to spend a year in Jordan and that was really helpful both for my Arabic and also for mm-hmm. understanding what I was actually doing and what I was actually dealing yeah. with. Yeah. Um, also in Germany, Islamic studies is more like, um, I mean, it, it includes fields like Middle Eastern history and Middle Eastern studies. So it's broader than you would think in the American context, uh, which is also why I did my PhD on Egypt first. So it doesn't, I mean, we have a lot of people in this discipline who work on like political science topics or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. Do, you have, do you have any distinctive memories or moments that were important to during that year in Jordan? During the year in Jordan, I, I, distinctive moments. Um, I'm not sure, yeah, I have a lot of good and a lot of shocking memories. I mean, <laughs> probably the one of the sh- more shocking ones was in my first lesson when the teacher asked like everybody, where, where are you from? And then f- fortunately not me, but the guy before me said Germany. And then she drew a swastika on the table and said uh, on the blackboard and said, do you know the sign? And we were all like, oh my gosh. Okay. Wow. <laughs> and wow. none of us had the, like you knew the amount of Arabic to say anything mean- meaningful. We were all just like, no, we don't like this. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and yeah, so um this is one one thing, but on the other hand, um, it was a very it was just a very good experience. It was also um, a multi-religious experience in a way. I had contact to Jordanian Christians, Jordanian Baha'is, and of course, loads of Jordanian Muslims. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was also interesting to see for me how minorities, members of minorities, lived there, um, what opportunities they had, what opportunities they didn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, and this has also been an ongoing interest in my work. Yes, yes. That was where I started studying Arabic as well, was in Jordan. Um, I was in Irbit. Yeah. Maybe you were in, were you in Amman? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I was in Amman, but yeah, I know Irbit. Yeah. In the north, yeah. Um, yeah, and I'd like to ask too, just things outside of uh, Islamic studies. Um, do you have particular hobbies, other sort of areas that you like to read in, certain movies or kinds of movies you like to watch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What would you say? Theoretically, I have lots of hobbies. Practically, I'm a full professor and have three children, so um, (laughs) there's not that much time for hobbies besides that. Um, And really, my my children are very important to me, and that takes up a lot of my free time. Um, But if I have some time, like really to myself, I quite enjoy fantasy literature mostly literature. I like reading more than watching movies or series, but I sometimes do those things too. So yeah. this is one thing I really enjoy. Um, also graphic novels um, on fantasy themes and others, other yeah. things. Um, Any recommendations if you were, someone wanted to start reading fantasy, do you have a book or, or two? Um, I, I just love the Broken Earth trilogy mm. by N.K. Jemisin. It's so great i can't emphasize how enough how great it is yeah. <laughs> so, I, like fantasy yeah. as well. I haven't i haven't read widely but um yeah yeah, yeah, yeah it's know. very it's very different i mean starting with the fact that the protagonist is like 42 year old woman or something so mm. 
I was like, wow, it's for, for start, it's not like an 18 year old male, like, you know, yeah, in yeah. Not every fantasy novel, or sometimes it's like a 16 year old girl, but it's always, you know, young adult kind of thing, and then they grow and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is completely different. This is a person who has already had a lot of experiences that had an impact on her in this universe. So mm, interesting. I really enjoyed this. Yes. So turning then from fantasy to Islamic studies, um, you know, along the way, I gave a brief biography, but I wonder if there were certain um, mentors or scholars that sort of formed the way um, that you began to research um, in tafsir, Quranic studies generally, or were there particular books that had a big impact on you in the field? Okay, so when I did my I mean, when, when I studied in Germany, we didn't yet have an, a, a separation between BA and MA. It was just one program. And, but in the, like the second stage of that program, I took a class with uh, Stefan Wild mm -hmm. at the University of Bonn on the Quranist text, which was a, an interest of his at the time. And it's, it's really strange, but at that time, not a lot of people in Germany, except for maybe Angelika Neuwert, were doing Quranic studies. It, it just wasn't a big thing. Um, a lot of people were like into Islamic law or whatever, but not, not really the Quran, and especially not the Quran as text. So uh, that was a really fascinating class. He always also invited uh, Nasser Hamid Abu Zaid, who had just been forced to leave Egypt and move yes. to the Netherlands. Um, and I mean, I was just like, I don't know, 22 year old student or something. And that was so impressive to me. Um, and really, um, I, I wrote an essay on Mahmoud Mohammed Taha um, for this class. And mm -hmm. I did a lot of research on that. And I found it absolutely fascinating. But then I, I did my PhD in a different direction. And I lost connection to this field for a number of years until I was in Berlin and I started teaching. Um, and I was supposed to come up with a class on, I don't know, religion, religious ideas, something related to this kind of theme. And I thought, okay, why not? I'm going to do something on the Quran and Quranic exegesis. So then when, when I started teaching on this, I, um, I kind of picked up where I had left off um, after I had taken this class. And I also saw, um, the many gaps there were in the like in the literature and research is on Quranic exegesis because um, there were some fields that um, I found a lot of texts that I could assign to students like Sayyid Qutb for example like millions of studies on his stuff here um, and all these like modernists and um, contemporary hermeneutical theories and so on you have a lot of literature on this it's kind of like these are the sexy topics and Everybody wanted to do it, but nobody wanted to do anything on what like mainstream ulama are doing. Um, yes, yes. And even on the history of exegesis, even on some of the foundational works of Tafsir, I couldn't really find a monograph or anything. So um, I thought, yeah, this, this could be a good topic to work on, um, which was partly because in Germany, you have to do a second book in order to become eligible. Uh, to become that's a professor, sure. And it has to be on a different topic than your PhD. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I was also looking for a new, um, new way for my research. And mm -hmm. because I already had two children at that time, it also preferably had to do something that I could do on my desk. Like, I mean, without going to... Egypt for two years to do field work right, or something. Right. So, um, and then I also thought this this could be a way to um, to work with my interests in languages. I had learned Indonesian, for example, by that point, and I also knew some Turkish. And mm. I thought it could be interesting to see um, what exegetes are doing in in different languages and whether the language they write their commentary and has an impact on their interpretation and if you can find any trends so this is what i did in my second monograph mm. and this is how i started working in this field mm. can, can i go back and ask just about that moment where you met nasser hamad abu zaid maybe maybe you met again on other occasions um but he also had a connection well i think he passed away in indonesia is that right um, I, I don't I'm not sure, I, but he, he did have a connection to Indonesia. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he's very popular there. Um, yeah, probably among yeah certain occurrence. Um, maybe yeah. 
Neo Maltesele, I don't know, maybe we'll get into this later, but do, do you have distinctive memories from um, from that class when you were with Professor Vild and Nasser Hamid Abu Zaid came? Um, any thoughts about, yeah, his work and what it represents? Um, I, I don't remember any specific things he said about the Quran that really struck me as, I mean, Obviously, he, he told us about his, his way of approaching the Quran, and I, I assume by now it's well known. I mean, it's just that at the time it wasn't. Um, so it was really like, wow, um, he's, he's actually taking this. I mean, he's, he's considering this text a divine text, but the language is a human language. So you kind of have to apply the categories of human languages and how you study literatures in these languages to the text. Um, so that was really fascinating. And the other issue was um, also when, when I study Quranic exegesis, I'm always very interested in the context and in the question why certain ideas are successful and other ideas are not successful or why some people are marginalized or persecuted and other people are like um, become authorities maybe. Yes. Um, and, and this was also like something, I mean, you had to wonder in his case, like what was so horrible about his ideas that he received yes. this kind of treatment and this kind of yeah. reaction. Yeah. Um, and Otraut Wieland, a scholar from Germany has actually written a very good piece in the book that Stefan Wild edited afterwards on the Quranic text yeah. um, about the reasons for, um, um, for the difficulties of, of talking about new approaches to the Quran. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she explained it very much in terms of um, like dictatorships and their interests um, and the way in which they co-opt um, certain parts of the religious establishment. Mm -hmm. And that enables the religious establishment to persecute people who are outside. I mean, Abu Zaid wasn't an, an alim and that was part mm -hmm. of the problem. Um, because there was, I mean, until now, sometimes even in Indonesia, I heard people express this idea that he had no right to talk about the Quran because he wasn't an alim. So, yeah, so there are a lot of like vested interests and um, connected to institutions and the role they play in particular states. And this is maybe, yeah, this is also a constant interest of mine. And um, this is really also something that started at that point. And I mean, also when I worked about Mahmoud Muhammad Taha, obviously he was executed in Sudan yeah. um, because of his kind of revolutionary ideas about how to interpret the Quran. That was a similar case, of course, because obviously it's not only about the ideas, it's also about the, like, yeah, what, what this person represents and the kind mm -hmm. of social impact they could have. Mm. My, my first time meeting uh, Nasser Hamad that was Aid was in, Beirut when he came long after he had left Egypt for the Netherlands. So I think it was 2011, but I'm not sure. But in any case, uh, it was at the Lebanese American University and gave a talk. And um, yeah, uh, I had, when I was just speaking with colleagues and things, there were lots of mixed reactions. And one thing I remember very distinctively was, you know, a very religious Muslim who said, yeah, well, Gabriel, what you don't get about the Egyptian reaction is that um, Egyptians are very religious and do you Westerners think um, in terms of rights and you know, freedoms and all of this, but um, uh, God has rights too, and the, the Ummah sort of needs to defend those rights. And anyway, was, that was a very yeah. interesting conversation. Well, why don't we go on? Did you want to say something, sir? No, no, it's fine. Okay, okay. Um, we are, why don't we go on to um, more directly uh, speak about, about Tafsir? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't have a huge library of, Tafsir works, but I, one of those rows behind me is some of the standard uh, tafsir or commentaries on the Quran. Um, so um, it's a big question and probably unfair, but I, could you say a couple of things about um, uh, what defines a work of tafsir? Um, what are the goals of a mufassir or, or an interpreter or commentator on the Quran? Maybe we can start there. Mm. Well, of course, that depends a bit. Um, I think especially if you look at the tradition until the 19th century, which continues in a way. I mean, you still find works that are completely in line with that tradition, but the field has become more diversified. Um, but if you look at this tradition, then um, 
basically you have to see that it's a scholarly discourse. And I think um, it's actually legitimate to compare it to um, how disciplines work in universities today. Mm -hmm. um, so there are certain requirements if you write a book within a field, um, you will be expected to use a certain style, you will be expected to cite certain authorities or to at least signal that you know the discourse in the field and not just, you know, come up with some ideas out of the blue. Um, so you, you will probably stay like make statements about the state of the art and whatever previous scholarship. So in a way, if people who are totally outside this look at your work, they might say, oh, chapter two is completely repetitive. Why is she just talking about other people's theories, etc." cetera? Um, and this is a bit what happens in Tafsir. I think it has, um, it, it was something that was primarily done for, by scholars, either for other scholars or for students who were aspiring to become scholars. And depending on whether it was more like done for the sake of students or more done for other scholars, it's more or less extensive and more or less elaborate, et cetera. Um, but still this explains why you have so much um, repetition because um, a Mufasa will always, they will go through the Quran first by first, which is something that has often been criticized in the modern right. period, right. also by other trends because um, yeah, it's an approach that has been called atomistic. Um, you don't really look at all the occurrences of a word. You could, but you don't really do it usually because you just look at this particular first and then you discuss all the exegetical problems, but you don't look at the larger context of the surah or the narrative structure or whatever. Um, and then you try to come up with all the interpretations there are from prophetic hadith to, mm -hmm. Um, through all the tough seers that have been written before to maybe the exegete's own idea, but the exegete doesn't really have to have an own idea. They could also just summarize everything that has been done before, and they also don't have to say which is the correct opinion. Mm -hmm. So that can be very confusing, and it's also um, something I notice with a lot of people starting to work in the field, and I think I was the same in the beginning. Um, so the idea was oh, I look at all these works of Tafsir and I will get an immediate impression of how the exeget thinks and what their, you know, attitudes to societal questions or whatever are. And it's not that easy usually. Um, I mean, it, obviously, if you look at some modern works like the Tafsir al-Manar or um, Said Qutb's Tafsir, it's easier because these, um, these works have their origins in mass media, like in the press, and they address a broader audience and they are much more personal and much more also meant to be entertaining in a way so you, yeah. you get excurses on contemporary issues is, right and so on and in these cases obviously you you can learn a lot about the exegetes opinion um, but if you look at a pre-modern scholarly terms here um, it can be very hard i mean obviously also depending on the exegete for example fakhreddin razi is really well known for expressing all kinds of theological and philosophical opinions, but that still doesn't necessarily mean he would tell you how he feels about the right of wives in the household or something. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but I think this is an expectation that a lot of people have. So, oh, I'm going to compare lots of tough seals and then I, I see like this clear trend in attitudes toward this or that topic and, um, in a way, you can see trends, but it's usually much more complex than people so, imagine. So maybe to take the classical case um, of Abu Jafar al-Tabari, uh, mm -hmm. where he is compiling different views um, of you know, earlier traditions, earlier opinions. Uh, and he, he will say something like, I don't know, the, yeah. people, the, party, the people of interpretation differ basically. Um, it, does that signal that his goal is, um, and then sometimes we'll end with Wallahu alam and God yeah. knows, right? Is that signify that his goal is simply to provide um, a resource for, for his students or other students um, so they can form their own opinions? I mean, yeah, in the case of Tabari, yeah. or maybe you want to comment on others about that? Sometimes, yes. Okay. Sometimes he does express an opinion. Okay. Quite clearly. And also, um, and Walid, Walid Saleh, um, who, is, who has inspired a lot of 
like the, the way in which I look at Tafsir. He has an interesting article on um, reading Ab Tabari in the light of Maturidi. Mm. And Maturidi's Tafsir has only recently been edited. Right, so, right, but also very and he's, major he's roughly a contemporary. And um, when looking at Maturidi, we can see that there were traditions around that Tabari must have known because they are cited in works that Tabari used, but he doesn't cite them. So obviously he had an agenda. He didn't, I mean, he, he pretends to cite everything, but he doesn't quite do mm -hmm. so, especially in, when certain theological questions are concerned. And also um, sometimes you can see, like if you look at classical studies of Tafsir, also like um, a lot of Muslim works of, on, on the history of Tafsir, Tabari is often represented as like the objective standard because he just compiles you know, he has no agenda, he's not um, Shi, he's not Sufi, he's not Mortazili, he's just Tabari. Um, but this is a kind of Sunni-centric perspective, I think, because there's a lot of specifically Sunni uh, material in it, even including this bit where, like, um, they come up with a lot of Sunni exegetes come up with very allegorical interpretations of like, um, I don't know, you have a surah, like it's, it's, I think it's surah, surah Dalasur, uh, Quran 103. In the, in the end, you have a verse which consists of four parts. And then they suddenly say, um, this signifies the Khulafa Rashidun. So this is uh, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali. And obviously that's, a, that's a, an extremely Sunni, <clears throat> like uh, yes. polemical, anti she way of like interpreting this first. And this is something that um, is usually framed as something that only Shi's or Sufis do and not the like ordinary mm -hmm. Tafsirs. Mm -hmm. But you mm -hmm. can even find traces of this in Tabari and um, certainly in other Sunni works. So um, yeah, I think we should be a bit cautious about treating Tabari as this totally detached scholar who just transmits and doesn't have an opinion. But of course, he, he does transmit very extensively, and his tafsir is very important for that reason. And, and do you have um, one mufassir, one commentator, with whom you feel like you have a good vibe? <laughs> you, really uh, know, you really know what he what he's up to. You find his interpretations fascinating. Um, you know, not not for theological reasons, but just you know, intellectual readings. Maybe pleasure of reading the tafsir. Um, I mean, I've worked on Shao Kani and I've quite enjoyed him because I think he's very clear. He's also very conceited. I don't, I don't know if I would have liked him as a person. I mean, he, he basically thinks he's the one true Mujtahid of his time and so on. And all the people before him had it wrong. And, um, but um, he also sometimes has a surprisingly historical approach. Like for example, everybody keeps citing a suburb on Nuzul. Um, and then suddenly Shaukani says, okay, but um, I don't care what the Isnat is. It can't be historical because this surah was like the last to be revealed in the suburb and Nuzul was before the Hitra. So mm. how come you just accept this? Um, you know, and this is a, a way of thinking you wouldn't expect at this point. Um, and another person was, um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if we should call him a Mufasser, but um, I've worked a bit on Ibn Taymiyyah recently, um, but not so much in the context of actual tafsir, but more um, in his Jawab Sahih, is like his um, apologetic polemical work against Christianity and um, how he deals with the Bible, the Quran, and the Quran and their relationship mm. um, and what hermeneutical approach he has. And, that is really interesting because he basically treats them as scriptures that can be interpreted in the light of each other because they come from the same speaker. Mm -hmm. And he basically also um, treats the parts of the Bible he knows as authentic, as long as they don't clearly contradict something that he believes to be true. Yeah. But um, if he has no strong evidence that or reason to believe that something can't be authentic, he treats it as the word of God. And then you can use it to interpret the Quran and the other way around, which is something that exegetes usually don't do. I mean, mm -hmm. Al-Bekai um, in the 14th century is a big exception, but normally exegetes just don't quote the Bible. Yes, 
Yes, there's an interesting work by uh, Michael McCoy on al Bekai and someone named Ibn Barajan in Andalusia, I think. Um, on yeah, Walid well, Saleh, actually, <laughs> again. <laughs> yes, of course, has worked yeah. on Al-Bakai. Yes, um, maybe yeah. Leila Demir has worked on some of these questions, but yeah, very interesting. Well, you sort of hinted at um, one uh, aspect of the, the next question, which is um, about modern modern tafsir. So what's distinct about modern tafsir? So you already said a really in, an interesting um, idea, which is that um, because some of them are connected to uh, sort of media productions because they come from serial publications in journals or um, uh, otherwise, um, uh, they have atten more attention to context, social context. I think it's in Tafsir Manar. I was reading about, I believe it's in Surat Al-Ma'idah where um, um, God says, Ahaytu lil hawariyin, something like this. And he and uh, Rashid Ridda in Tafsir Manar, I, I think that part is Ridda, but maybe I'm wrong and it's Muhammad Abdul. Oh, it's definitely. It's Ridda. Yeah. yeah. So he says something, oh, well, wahi. You know, it's different than Tanzil. So inspiration is different from revelation or sending down. And um, it's more like, he compares it, I think, to a telegraph, which at the mm -hmm. time was like a thing, right? So he communicated yeah. his telegraph. I think he does. And I thought, oh, that really stood out to me. Like that's a, that's a very specific uh, sort of contextual example to use. Yeah. Anyway, so um, yeah, what are some of the distinctive features of modern tafsir? And again, that's a huge, question yeah. because there's modern I mean, so many yeah. different contexts and countries but uh, is i mean maybe is there such a thing as modern tafsir as a genre distinctive from classical or medieval no i don't think there's a genre of modern tafsir but we have several genres that are new for different reasons um first of all you mentioned media that's very important um because if you start writing um like installments on the Quran for a newspaper or you do taf tafsir on TV, it's just different from writing for other scholars. Um, and very often these people actually don't call their works tafsir. Like for example, if you take the Egyptian Sheikh Sharawi, he had this TV show and he interpreted the Quran um, and it was more like sermons. Um, and it also originally wasn't called tafsir, it was called reflections on the Quran or something like that. But then it was published as a book and now you can buy it everywhere as tafsir as sharawi. And the interesting thing is that the tafsir tradition just absorbs it because it's still in this, you know, first by first structure and the canonical right. arrangement. So it's very easy to absorb into the tafsir tradition. Even though the uh, origins are completely unique or different from a standard work. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he just goes into all these excurses um, where like, for example, the Quran says like the righteous will be the heirs of paradise or something. And he, he, then he goes into like a rant about an inheritance law and how people in Egypt disregard it. And obviously the first is not at all about this, but um, it's just, you know, it's very... Um, anecdotal and um, whatever comes to his mind. You know, it could be a scholarly explanation of grammar or syntax, but it could also be a rant on whatever, social customs in Egypt or something. Um, and still it's called tafsir and you, you have this orderly structure in the book first by first and any subsequent exeget could just look what he says on Quran 3, 123 or something um, and integrate it into their tafsir. And the same thing happened to Suicide to Qutb who didn't call his work a tafsir actually, but he called it Fi al Quran because he was quite aware that he was not a trained mufassir, but still afterwards people just used it like a tafsir. Um, um, but the style and the, the audience, the target audience are, are very different. Um, and then another phenomenon that you have is um, people who are looking for different kinds, um, different ways to arrange the material, for example, uh, thematic tafsir. Um, and this again can take various forms. Um, some exegetes try to do it by surah and then look at the major themes of a surah. Um, and others actually, um, I don't know, look at a theme and just collect everything in the Quran that relates to that theme. And then it becomes kind of very hard to say if this is still tafsir because yeah, it, it could just be a book called Women in the Quran or something. Right. Um, nice. And then we have this trend to do chronological arrangement, the order of revelation. 
uh, which is, has been very popular in Turkey in the past 20 years, but we mm. also have some works in the Arab world and even um, one of the very, very first English Quran translations by Muslim even did this. And he was, he had actually done his PhD in Berlin in the late 19th century. And he was very much influenced by Theodor Nöldeke. So mm. uh, this is quite fascinating. Um, and then another, another really important thing is that um, in the 19th century, early 20th century, exegetes more and more come, came up with this idea that was very strongly expressed by Muhammad Abdu, that the Quran should be read as Hidayah. Um, mm -hmm. So he was super critical of classical tafsir because he said it's like, it's just a futile scholarly exercise. Uh, they don't care about the Quran's message or meaning or anything. They just care about, um, you know, scholastic disputes and um, grammatical niceties. Um, and that's not what's important. We have to bring the Quran's message across to people. Um, so the Hidayah, the right mm -hmm. guide or something. Um, and I think this is a very strong tendency. Also, if you, um, this is kind of, I think a lot of Muslims I talk to say that this is off-putting to them about the classical tafsir tradition. Mm, mm. because they can't find the Hidayah. <laughs> mm, very interesting, right. Because, so, yeah, when Tabari just lists like five different opinions and he says, Wallahu alam, okay. Yeah, how does do this? this? And yeah. even if he picked the correct opinion, it might just be something like, okay, this Sabah Banuzul is the correct one. It's the most authentic. Okay, so what, I mean, what do I do with this now? And he doesn't say so, because that wasn't his interest. Mm. Because I, I think Muslims at that period would have expected the Hidayah not from Tafsir, but from um, Fiqh, for example. Um, I wonder if this yeah. concern with guidance is a response to an awareness of secularism, um, sort of globally, right? that, that we need to be attentive in forming, um, forming Muslims, tablir, you know, yeah. communicating the truth about Islam. Uh, because there's a menace out there of secularism and and even atheism and I don't know. Mm, no, I think it starts before that, and I think this is there are two aspects. The one is definitely a perception that things are going wrong. Um, not so much because of atheism, but simply because of the European dominance. Okay. Okay. So I mean, Europeans are everywhere. They are dominating the whole world. They are colonizing Muslim countries. And our societies don't have any way of defending themselves. And that must be because we are decadent. We are not really you know, heeding the true message of Islam. So this is one idea. But the other interesting question is why would religious reform have to happen to the Quran? Because as I just said, I mean, you could just as well look for Hidayah in Fiqh, for example. Yes. Actually, in, in terms of pre-modern scholarship, it would make much more sense to look for Hidayah there. Um, so it's this just, is also a very strong... Sorry, mm -hmm. just to explain in case someone among the listeners doesn't know, fiqh meaning jurisprudence. So yeah, exactly. Context. So yeah. jurisprudence is actually where you, you are told, okay, this is the correct solution to this problem, um, which is what people are looking for. Um, and the Quran is one of the sources, but not the only source. Um, so, and here I think there's also a very strong impact of um, Christianity and the view of scripture. Um, and Islam is a scriptural religion, meaning that the Quran has this really central role, not just in prayer and in recitation and so on, which it, all, which it has always had, but also in terms of informing a Muslim's ethics and actions and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is really a very modern idea. Yes, yes. Well, why don't we turn to a couple of uh, Quranic passages to sort of explore the range of possible interpretations. And I tried to pick out a couple which I thought would be um, sort of cruxes or um, uh, points where there would be um, dynamic discussion and disagreement. So, um, yeah, so Quran, uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, Quran 2, verse 7, uh, speaks of God's sealing hearts, khatam Allahu ala qulubihim, and hearing, wa ala So um, uh, th that raises the, the question, I think of a free will. What does it mean that God seals a heart? Mm -hmm. um, so um, I just wonder how has this worked out in the Indonesian context? I know you've worked a bit on that, or if you want to speak about other contexts um, in light of Islamic theology, like what are the big problems here and how are they solved? 
I mean, the big problem is obviously like if you read the first in the way um, that it is mostly read by uh, like mainstream Sunni scholars, it means that um, while God has sealed the sight and hearts and ears and whatever of the unbelievers, so they aren't even able to believe because God has decided this. So um, the problem with this is that in the end they are punished by being sent to hell for something they didn't have any yes. choice in. So um, what does okay, this say? Hat Hatima has in Arabic, I mean, as you've pointed out, so I'm getting this from you. Yeah. It's, it's, but it has, yeah. it has sort of two meanings, right? Uh, two possible meanings: to close or to affirm or confirm or something like. That. Well, it's to seal something. Mm -hmm. um, so it it has usually been understood in the in the sense of closing something firmly, mm -hmm. and putting a seal on it so it can't be reopened. Um, yeah, and and that of course raises the question of divine justice because wouldn't it be completely unfair? of God to sentence people to hellfire if they hadn't, didn't have any choice um, about being unbelievers in the first place. Um, so, and I mean, obviously there's a huge, huge and complex debate in Islamic theology that started very early and was mostly settled in favor of God's, um, God's power to do and will everything. Um, and whatever he wills is inherently fair. Um, but of course there was also school that was uh, that had the opposite opinion and said um, God's fairness has to be in some ways of, of a kind that can be understood by human standards. So well, it can't just be context. like a circular thing. So and in, in the modern period, especially in Indonesia, but also in a lot of other places, this seems to become an issue after it hadn't been an issue in Tafsir for a long time. Um, so we find traces of the free will um, idea in the in the very popular Tafsir of Zamakhshari, which was in the 12th century um, CE. Uh, he was a Mortazili, so obviously he had um, he had he had the idea of um, that humans have free will and he had to find some explanations for this. Um, but that was basically shunned um, and later exegetes don't develop it or don't even mention it. And then in the 20th century, it comes up again. And then the idea is um, to, to resolve this issue partly through translation, because um, at least in Indonesia, I mean, you can't do this in, in Arabic as easily, but in, in Indonesia, then the idea is um, to seal could also mean to put a stamp on something. Mm -hmm. And then it would, go, would mean um, like the, God putting a stamp on the unbeliever's decision. So first the unbeliever makes the decision and then God yes, puts yes. a stamp on it. Very interesting. And, and then, there, it. So there's a specific uh, Bahasa Indonesian word that can yeah. mean just to put a stamp on that can, that is yeah. used. Okay. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, um, another major theological debate in Islamic tradition, and we're sort of touching on things that have a huge library of, uh, of um, writings about them, but the question of anthropomorphism. Um, so there are, there are a couple of verses which speak of the face of God. Uh, one is in Surat al-Baqarah again, one another is in Quran um, 55, um, which uh, speaks about the face of the Lord remaining. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, I mean, in Arabic, maybe you can correct me here, but maybe there's some Again, a broad semantic range to the Arabic word waja, because mm -hmm. um, it can be a face, it can also be an aspect or something like that. Um, but then when you translate, so for example, when you translate into Indonesian, um, uh, how does that work out? Um, it, it, are there different options, different words to choose from for a translator? Do we see sort of theolog theology playing a role in that decision? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the interesting thing here is um, I've started this project, the Global Quran that you mentioned in the beginning last year, and I have a diverse team who are working on Quran translations into different languages. And this is probably the most divisive issue across mm -hmm. the world, because mm -hmm. um, this is such an essential rift between traditional theologians and Salafis. Um, so Salafis usually say um, they they don't consider themselves anthropomorphic, so they don't really believe that God has a hand or a face in the sense that humans do, but they also believe if the Quran says so, we just have to take it for granted 
and not inquire into what, what it might mean. And we have to translate it literally. Um, so um, and another example is um, the, the statement in the Quran, um, for example, at the beginning of Surah 20, is Tawa al-Alash. So he was kind of established above the throne or something. So the expression is kind of difficult because it, it, it isn't just sitting on, but it's being above something. But um, so Salafis would just say, okay, God is above the throne, but it's a huge theological problem because the anti-anthropomorphism camp says God can't have a position in space. It God isn't a place. body. Yes. God can't be above a throne or something. It, it's just impossible. Um, so they have even more of an issue with this than they have with the face and the hands because these things can be metaphorical in many languages actually. So if you take something in hand or whatever, even in English, it could easily be understood metaphorically. Um, but the throne is, yeah, well, a throne is a throne. So, um, so we have a lot of translations that say like um, God's power is everywhere or God dominates everything or something just to avoid so this issue. Yeah. Um, and this is a very clear identity marker, kind of whether you are associated with the traditional Ashari, um, Aturidi um, mm. scholarship, or whether you are Salafi. But not only the Salafis, um, but also some of the very modernist reformers had a big problem with this. For example, Muhammad Ali of the, the Ahmadiyya movement, who um, published an English Quran translation in 1917, he also has a completely um, different translation, um, like in Quran 2, 255, which is normally called the throne first, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. God's throne or Kursi is mentioned, yeah, a different he, word. he just yes. translates it as God's knowledge. So if you mm -hmm. just read the translation, you wouldn't even guess that there's a Kursi mentioned in Arabic. Mm. And I remember you mentioned that there, it's even more complicated because there's a hadith according to which the Kursi is the footstool yeah. That God rests his, the soles of his feet on. Yeah, uh, exactly. So there's another, a whole other possibility yeah. for that verse. And, and that's, for example, then you can see that the King Fahd complex in Medina, uh, they publish Quran translations into all kinds of languages. And in some cases, they do their own translations, but in some cases, they also take existing translations and publish them. Um, and for example, they took the Indonesian translation by the Indonesian Ministry of Religion but they actually explain the Kursi as um, power and knowledge or something. Okay. Um, and then the Saudis took this out and instead put a footnote that says it's his footstool. So yeah, this is obviously also uh, well, the speaking Salafi. Of hadith, maybe we can speak about one, one more verse, which is in Surah Al-Fatiha. I think it's verse seven, the final verse, which speaks of the, um, those upon whom uh, there is anger and those who are astray. So there in the second part of the opening surah of the Quran, um, the believer is addressing God, um, asking to be, um, to be guided not in those paths. Uh, but there's, there, there are traditions which associate um, very specifically those upon whom there is anger with the Jews and those who are straight with the Christians. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe if we stick to the Indonesian context when it comes to translations, I mean, that's something you don't have to say at all, right? In a translation, because you can just stick to translating the words in Arabic. You don't have to insert um, that sort of uh, gloss or um, expansion on the verse. But does, does that happen in translations? Do, do people add, I don't know, in parentheses or in footnotes or in, do they find a way to insert that kind of tradition? Yes, it does happen. And obviously it depends first of all on the translator's approach to translation, whether they are very much into just, you know, rendering the semantic meaning of the words in the Quran and nothing else. Even then they could put a footnote, which some of them do. Um, but there are also, um, there are a lot of Muslim translators, especially who feel that the translation should be more like a concise tafsir. Um, so it could, should give more context and more meaning and more explanation um, because it's not a replacement of the Quran anyway. Um, I think Muslims are fairly unanimous about that, that you can't replace the Arabic Quran for ritual purposes, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't imitate its rhetoric in a different language. Uh, the best you can try to do is to represent the meanings. 
Um, and then some translators are like, okay, if I am only representing the meanings, I could as well add explanations right. like right. Eric Consai's Tafsir would do, because it's clear that this is my opinion on what the Quran says anyway. Um, and these translators might just add, okay, these are the Jews, these are the Christians. Um, obviously, that's a very political issue. Um, so in Indonesia, for example, um, we have this very dominant translation by the Ministry of Religion, which is everywhere on the market and which most people accept as authoritative. Um, and then there was a counter translation by a kind of um, Islamist guy in 2011, I think, Muhammad Talib. Um, and he explicitly published his translation as a counter translation to the ministry translation. And he had a second volume in which he explained mistakes in the ministry translation or what he considered mistakes. And um, his argument was that you have to do a Tajama Tafsiriya, so like an explanatory translation and not a Tajama Hafsiya or literal translation, because otherwise the readers won't get important meanings. Um, and he said, he even accused the government of fostering terrorism because um, without giving context on um, verses about war, for example, people could get the impression that they are universal and it doesn't depend on the actions of the opponent and whatever. So um, this kind of thing, but he also added a reference to the Jews and Christians um, in, in Quran 1.7. Um, and generally, he seemed to feel that the government is not anti-Jewish enough in their discourse. So I think he was really more concerned with the Jews than the Christians. So this is one case where you can see how political it is. And the opposite example would be the translation the Saudis uh, published by Hilali and Khan. Um, I think it was first published in the 1970s and uh, then the Saudis published it in the late, late 1980s or something um, in English. and um, when it hit American mosques, there was a big uproar because it mentioned the Jews and Christians as those with whom God is angry, etc. Right, right. um, and obviously, this was not politically correct at all. This was a big problem. Um, so actually, um, in the last few years, the Saudis have changed their general policy and they have also changed their guidelines for translations and they are removing this from lots of translations. Now That's very interesting. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, more than once people have pointed out the that um, gloss in the Halali Khan. I think it's in parentheses yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, to me. Yeah. Well, um, there's. I, I've uh, took, taken a lot of your time and I um, maybe... Uh, no, I've, I, I've I, talked I too much, as usual. <laughs> no, no, you haven't. It's really, it's really interesting. There's so many more questions I want to ask, but maybe I would say most of it for another session. I, I, do, I do want to showcase a bit this really amazing project that you're leading, the Global Quran. I just alluded to it at the very beginning in the introduction. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I know you have a translation of the week, uh, which is really fascinating. So I really encourage everyone to, to check that out and follow on social media, Twitter, and otherwise the Global Quran project. But yeah, could you just introduce us to the project? What are the goals and what are the activities? Yeah, yeah so I'm super happy with this project. It's, um, it's funded by the European Research Council, which is about the biggest funding you can get in the humanities. So for the first time, I'm actually able to work with a team on one issue, and that's a, it's a great team, and it's such a great experience. Um, and uh, the, the topic of the project is the transnational dimensions of Quran translation um, in the modern period, so mainly the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, so we're looking at missionary movements like the Ahmadiyya movement. Um, we're looking at international actors like the King Fahd complex in Medina and uh, also the Directorate of Religious Affairs in Turkey, who also have a program of publishing Quran translations in all kinds of languages. Um, and we are also looking at the dynamics of Quran translation in former imperial languages um, like English, French, Russian and Dutch, where you have a lot of Muslims who speak these languages today. Um, and they kind of have to navigate um, Muslim traditions of interpreting the Quran and um, the fact that the language in, in which they translate has a Christian history. So the question is, for example, what religious terminology to use? Do I say prayer when I mean salat? Because prayer in Christianity has a different connotation than salat, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And then you have an Orientalist tradition of translating the Quran in all these languages. So do I use that? 
or do I try to make it different, for example, by inserting a lot of Arabic terminology and trying to make it into like loan words that Muslims would use? Um, do I use a biblical style, for example, um, until the 1970s? All the Muslim translators of the Quran into English were totally into King James style. Okay. Everybody was doing it. You, you it, was just, it was just the, the only way to translate the Quran. I mean, the non-Muslims were doing it as well. I think the first one who did was Dawood in the 1950s, mm. um, who did the Penguin Classics yes. Um, yes. translation. And he was really the first who said, I want to translate the Quran into contemporary English. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the first Muslims who were doing it, that can only have been later, probably. Right. Hilal. Because Dawood was an Iraqi Jew, is that right? Yeah, he was a yeah. Jew, exactly. Yeah. So he was yeah. not a Muslim, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a question that comes up. Um, and so, yeah, you have all these interesting dynamics in these languages. Um, and yeah, so with our team, we are looking at these questions um, from different angles. And it's super fascinating. And as you said, we have this um, social media presence, which was partly born out of the fact that we started right in the middle of the first lockdown last year. And we, we wanted some way to, to promote our work and being connected also within the team. Um, so we are taking turns writing something about any Quran translation into any language, but with a focus on translations by Muslims or translations that are at least used by Muslims a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and just anything that strikes us as interesting, remarkable, um, yeah. So if people want to learn more, um, then maybe they, they start at the website, is that right? And could you give yes. us the, the URL for that? The glowcore.de, so glowcore is G-L-O-Q r dot d e n there we have our blog and we also have a twitter feed and facebook page and youtube channel yeah i i'm there on on twitter is the one social media um uh, outlet i use but it's really it's really cool to see the translation of the week and it you know it goes from czech to i think there was a, a dutch no there was an afrikaans one so a south african in africa yeah, i did that last it's week big. and okay. that was my very favorite thread of all the threads I've done so far, and we've done all in all among us more than 80 so far. Wonderful. But that was such a fascinating story. And yeah, I'm, I really like getting into the stories behind these translations. Well, it's really been a pleasure and there are other topics I wanted to get to, but uh, maybe maybe we can uh, have you back at some point on exploring the Quran and the Bible. Sure, yeah, thank you so much, Johan. Thank you, Gabriel. Well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the, um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars. And um, we'll be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.